Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joe Mercurio from the City of Port St. Lucie Emergency Management. Uh, with me today is Ms. Darlene McLaughlin from WastePro, who has been our title sponsor for today. We thank her very much. Uh, this afternoon, we just want to talk to you about our hurricane debris management, which always seems to be quite a focus after a storm has occurred. And that's what we're going to focus on here today. One of the big things, of course, uh, from our many presentations and the benefit of having this exposition is, were you ready? Uh, we want to make sure that, again, you had learned your safe routes that were inland. Uh, we learned where the hurricane shelters were had located. Uh, we developed, again, family plans. And uh, we had survival kits, and we ensured we had enough perishable foods and things that were inside that. The big thing we always like to push during this time of year, and we just even spoke to it on the radio, is that, again, that folks had trimmed all their shrubbery that has taken place now. Uh, again, especially for Waste Pro, uh, it's that time of year when we begin to, to trim our hedges and get that stuff out. Darlene, do you want to talk about the size of the piles that we expect? Uh, the piles should be no larger than six cubic yards, um, cut down in manageable sizes, no more than four feet long, and um, which is easy for the, uh, the, if it's small enough, our crews will grab that. If it's larger, our uh, clam trucks will grab it. Because um, what happens is when a storm gets named, basically their operations have to shift to, shift to different types of emergency operations. Uh, there's no longer that real ability to go out there and collect this type of debris when you start putting it out there. That's why we ask folks now, June 1st, to go ahead and start trimming all that stuff out. Uh, again, we made sure that folks had all their shutters up and plywood bought, uh, had cleaned everything up, and just checked again for your insurance and your pets. But now the big thing, and what we're talking about today, is when the name storm actually makes land. Or as Matthew had shown, it just skirted off the coast of Florida and it caused quite a debris that occurred throughout the entire city. Uh, matter of fact, when I first walked around, I could tell, I was like, it really didn't do very much. Uh, there wasn't even very much debris. But by the second and third day, the folks had dragged everything out to curbside and we really had quite a bit on our hands. So now this is what we do. After the storm passes, we definitely know that our major roads will be impacted. They're very impassable. So we ask folks to get, go ahead, just still remain inside until told to do or told to come back outside. The power lines, again, will be down. We can expect that power will be non-existent. And again, that flooding may be present. If we live on Hutchinson Island, again, they ask many folks to evacuate. They probably will not be given that notice to go back but if you do, you need to have that proof, of that, you do, that proof of residency that you do live there. And again, if your building or your house has uh, sustained any type of damage, uh, we ask that you don't enter until our city's building department has had that opportunity to go out and look at it. What is the city doing, the ta doing during the time after a hurricane storm? And as it states that, again, our police department, our fire rescue department is out making sure that the lives and the safety of all the residents are secure. So they're doing life-saving actions. Our city's public works department, they're out what's initiating called a first push. We're actually out there pushing debris off the main arteries of the roads. Those from fire departments, police departments, hospitals, clearing the main roads and then they start working themselves into secondary and the smaller roads. Uh, PSL, Utilities department, again, they're assessing any type of clean water actions in case the plant had gone down off power. They're starting their emergency generators. And then again, our city begins doing that risk assessment, doing the actual look around the entire city to see what actually has happened to it. It's not so much the damage assessment, but where's the flooding? Where's the damage? Where's the most things that have happened? From that, we get what we call the recovery and the debris collection. And again, with our partners with WastePro, in, in essence, they're taking sort of a back seat, but yet they remain our partners in this. The city maintains contracted uh, haulers to go ahead and get debris. They are in place, they're here, they're pre-staged. 
Uh, depending on the size of the storm, there's industry standards to how they bring in what type of equipment. Waste Pro also is in their emergency operations. They go into things, again, trying to clear this as much, but again, they're still focused on getting the, that residential refuse and residential recycling like they used to, and basically just the small piles. Again, the pre-stage with equipment, we have a monitoring firm that goes out with each hauler to make sure they're picking up exactly what they say they're picking up because uh, the city looks for reimbursement toward the federal government, specifically FEMA. So they're out there to see exactly what the hauler is picking up. Uh, we have a debris manager, and again, our communications department is pushing out information to all the folks on exactly what's happening uh, for everywhere, and they also set up a debris hotline. What this map reflects and what we use for the city, again, is a pre-planned district of how we pick up the debris. This is what we give to our debris hauler to go out and work through these zones to pull all that refuse. So again, the city right now has 14 zones in which to work through. And basically, it's like a big concentric circle. We go to the furthest point and we work inward. But again, your big areas like uh, number 14 and number eight are not really residential. So we're able to get through those areas very quickly and head into the more residential areas that have been impacted. These are the types of debris that we expect after a storm. And this is again what uh, Waste Pro and our contract prepares for. It's a vegetative debris. Again, those common things like the prawns, the palm trees. Uh, when we talk about hazardous trees, those are the things that we call leaners. Uh, the limbs that hang, you see them when the trees are down. These are the ones that are hanging out there. And then the hazardous stumps. What we didn't get this time, but if you see pictures of the old hurricanes, is the construction and demolition. That's your roofing material, your fences, your house structures. Uh, it's all that wood. And then you have your white goods in case stoves, ovens, uh, washers, dryers, all that have gone bad. That's the stuff that comes out. Soil mud, you see it wash up on Hutchinson Island a lot. And uh, a lot of our flood zones where our public works department is pushing that back. Uh, a lot of times we lose vehicles, we lose boats, and again, there's just a normal household refuse. I'm going to hand this over to Darlene, and she's going to talk about some of the instructions that we have for the debris piles that we see. This is the bad ones. Okay. Okay. Um, the pile here in the right-hand corner, um, what you're seeing, and, and in the left-hand corner, what you're seeing is people just taking the trash, not bagging it, and throwing it out to the street. Um, this is not acceptable, but unfortunately, we get at least 25 to 30 of these piles every week. And if you notice, there's not even a garbage bag to be seen. So just the effort of having to carry this material out to the road, uh, it would have been cheaper to get a bag. So, you know, that is not acceptable. We still pick it up, but, um, and I, I believe the city is working on some ordinance uh, to deal with this. Plus, if we have a really heavy wind, um, that's going to litter the whole community. Um, the city of Port St. Lucie is a beautiful city and it's a clean city. And um, this type of, of set out is definitely not acceptable. Uh, the top right hand corner, uh, that's a yard debris pile that is illegal. Um, they've been clearing a lot and putting it at the road that is not acceptable. Um, we work very, very closely with code, code enforcement and um, they actually go out when we report this type of um, set out and um, address it. These are actually, this one uh, on the right hand side is an acceptable yard waste pile uh, along with the one above. Um, these are, these are proper set outs, and these are set outs that, um, that we will pick up. And just so you know, with Waste Pro, when they're actually running through after a storm, and you'll see the truck pass the house, again, our contractor with the clam truck picks up the larger piles. However, when it's a small pile like that, that one individual can pick up with his hands and put into the truck, that's fine, because that's the type of material that you guys put out normally. So again, after a storm, the truck may pass the house if it's a pile that they cannot handle, such as the one down here in the corner, right there. 
but this is acceptable because one driver can go ahead and grab that and throw it right in the truck. Again, uh, these have been flyers throughout the conference. These are items, and we specifically ask that you segregate them when you put them out front. Again, we're asked folks to bring them past the sidewalk toward the street and just put them in different piles so that, again, our contractor and Waste Pro is able to grab them very quickly. Uh, this just represents old sites that the city used to have. Again, when we make that haul, the city provides what we call debris management sites. Uh, again, it's an area by which we can segregate, again, separate our material. Whether it's vegetative, we're able to grind it, sell it as mulch, or put it out to the dump site. But we have things like what we call mixed debris, where it's just there's so much stuff together, construction material, vegetative, that they just put it in large piles. And it goes right out to a west site. And then again, just pure vegetative type debris. Uh, if folks were here back in the city back in 2004, this is called the Juliet site, but it is now known as Crosstown Parkway. This does not exist anymore. Uh, our current site right now is at what we call California, uh, a site, and I'll, there'll be a picture of that. There it is, California site. Uh, and as you see, the community has also grown up around that. So as a, as a manager and as city leaders, what we do is look to find different opportunities for us to collect because, again, Matthew was very heavy. When Matthew hit, by the time we closed this site, it was 143 days of collection, mulching, and putting that out to our uh, landfill sites. This is just some of the statistics off Matthew. I know a lot of our meteorologists talked about Matthew today, so I just want to show you what some of our statistics were in collection. Again, uh, all that material that was collected, loaded up, became about near 200 piles of mulch that became 3.9 tons of material that this city collected after Matthew. So again, uh, this is just where the information came from. Uh, I remain available. Again, I'm Joe Mercurio from the City of Port St. Lucie, Darlene McLaughlin from uh, WastePro. That's our presentation really on debris management.